their skin. I mean, also they are human beings, they are what they are. So uh, it's a bit similar. And with Sigrid uh, compared to non-professional actors, for me it was not very much difference in, in working with her. The only thing for me that is important with actors is that they can be as natural as non-professional actors. And that is quite rare. Mm -hmm. And I think Sylvie Testwit could do that. Yeah, because yeah, I know as an actor that it's so much easier to do scenes where you cry or you're angry yeah. and you have a lot of emotion because that gives you a sense of direction and you also can hide a bit behind that strong emotion. But when you strip a character of emotions and you just have to be, that's very exposing yeah. uh, and can be hard to portray, actually. Yes. Uh, did you feel that with the professional that they wanted to express more than... Um, the, the French have very great film actors. They are more used to the fact that making a film, it's, it's a different work than playing for theater, for example. In Austria and Germany, you have a lot of actors that normally work for the theater. So you start at a different point. You have to like make them calmer, more natural, make them forget that they don't have to shout for the last row and things like that. You don't have to do that with French <coughs> actors because they have much more films being made. They, they, they know the film business. Um, but, uh, but something that you mentioned before that if it's easier to, to have a strong emotion for example, when I do the casting, I ask actors to eat. Um, or, also difficult, to wait. Because then, that is difficult. And then, some, most of the times, the actor asks me, do I like the food or not? I said, nothing special. Am I hungry or not? N not especially. Am I in a hurry or not? Oh, not very much in a hurry. I try to escape those answers yeah. because, I mean, normally <laughs> I eat something and there are no clear emotional expressions. I just eat. <laughs> and that is very <laughs> difficult. Yes, yes, I know. It's, it's awful. And dancing scenes are awful. Yes, they're that's very the hard thing as well. I do at the because you express something yeah. from you your, within lie. yourself. Yeah. Exactly, so, um, but the thing I thought about Lourdes was that it was such great cinematographer free as well and that you work with these really stylistic tableaus and you fill them up with a lot of extras. It's a really grand movie and almost an epic movie because mm. it's like this fairy tale about this woman who gains her feeling back in her legs and can walk again. And, and how did you work with the cinematographer? Because uh, it was... Um, we, we, we've made all my films together. Martin Schlacht is also part of the production, production company that, that I'm part of. So we know each other from, the, the, from studying. And we have made um, all my films together. So I work with him all the time and also with the set designer, the costume designer, the editor, the makeup, makeup artist. <laughs> um, and the uh, co-raptor. So I have a, a, um, a main team that, that I work with every time because it's good to be able to develop a special style. And Martin and I, we have um, developed that sort of language together. I do the storyboards, I make little drawings, but he can interpret them because I, if I make those little drawings, it's, it's like a children's drawing. Mm -hmm. It's not about um, perspective or which angle or which objective we, we use but he can translate it. He can translate it into a cinematographic language and he knows where to put the camera to have exactly that frame that I was drawing on my painting. So we have that storyboard on the set and, and then 
some people make fun of us because then we are start to argue. I say, no, look, it's like that. And we said, but it is like that. And I think, no, it's like that. Look, it's only the half face. And then he puts the camera a millimeter to the left side. So we work long on where is the, what is the frame. That is the most important thing. And for example, maybe that is also an interesting thing to, to, to say about actors in Lourdes. It was very complicated because we, there were so many actors um, in the frame. And it took very much time to organize the scene. It's, it's almost like yeah. a choreography. Yeah, it was, yeah. yeah. It took several hours to do the rehearsals. And at, until the moment when everyone knew when he goes where and says what or does what. <laughs> and, um, and that was, sometimes we shot only one scene a day or one frame a day. What do you say that? One frame, yeah, mm -hmm. one, one shot a day. Um, but that's like, for me, that is the point of view that I have. I try to, to create an, an image or a, a scenery. And the actor is part of it, as is the table or the glass of water or the lighting. And I know in, in Amufo, the movie that we've all seen, you said that the actors had to be even more naturalistic than usually, because the whole scenery is very strict and very, you have to fill it up with some sort of life and naturalism. Yes. Um, I was looking for actors that are not, uh, like how do I say that, um, when I confront the actors with the fact that there is a choreography. Some like it, for example the actor who was playing the male main role, Heinrich, he liked it. It was easy for him to, to accept all those uh, ballet <laughs> instructions and he could still be natural. He didn't forget himself about because of that. He was, um, an, I think, a, an actor that could cope with that method very well. Another actor was really frustrated because he thought that he's losing his his naturality because of that. instinct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, the, the point is, of course, if I do this sort of choreography, I don't want uh, the whole thing to become bad. So I need actors <laughs> that somehow fight against me, mm -hmm. that somehow say, yeah, but she will see, I will then suddenly do this and that. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking forward to that moment. <laughs> that surprise element. Yes, yes, like, yes. Okay, yeah. If there is a little tension going on, then it's getting interesting because then suddenly, within all those restrictions, someone suddenly um, shows a very human side. Yeah. And it's such, you've described Amurfo as a romantic comedy about a suicide pact. <laughs> uh, why? Well, I guess it's kind of ironic as well. Yes, it's, yeah. it's ironic. It's the distributor's idea, or no, not the Swedish distributors, but the, the, <laughs> the world sales agent's idea to, to have that log line. Um, I was okay with it because I think there is, of course, a humor in the story. Um, the humor comes from the fact that something that you normally treat with seriosity is here treated with banality, <laughs> if you want. <laughs> Someone says, instead of, do you want to marry me, he says, do you want to die with me? So it's an, it's an uh, putting upside down expectations. And that, that is a comic element, of course. Yeah, you rip this whole young Werther myth about this epic and beautiful love and star-crossed love. And you make it very human yeah. and very banal in a way that, you know, he discusses, do you want to die with me? And then he drinks tea. It's yeah. like a very strange cross between yeah. the banality and the epicness of Great love. <laughs> the, the banality actually comes from the fact that he asks different women. Yeah. That, was the, that was the initial moment when I decided that's my story. <laughs> because I was doing, I was thinking of making a film about a double suicide out of love for a long time. And I was doing research never ending. 
but I didn't find the story that really inspired me. I was really frustrated, then I put it aside, I made another film, which was Lourdes, then I came back to it and um, I was rereading all the stuff that I had collected and I came, I read again that article about Heinrich von Kleist um, and suddenly I, uh, maybe I hadn't, I wasn't ready for it earlier, but then I was laughing because I was reading that Kleist actually himself, he asked different people if they would want to die with him. He asked his best <laughs> friend, he said no. Then he asked his cousin, Mary, and she said no. And then he met that young woman, Henriette Vogel, who thought that she was going to die anyway. And she said yes. And I, I, was, I was really, I had to laugh. And, and suddenly I thought, yeah, that's interesting. It's, it's the opposite of what you expect from a romantic pact of love that is stronger than death. It was a suicide <laughs> slot, in a way. <laughs> in a way, yeah. And you also said that um, on the knowledge of love, that if you are close to someone or if you love someone, you see yourself very much in that other person, and that makes the reality becomes very subjective. You became very exposed to other people's opinions. You not really have your own core. Um, I think what I was trying to say in that quote was that uh, that of course in a relationship. It's a sort of mirror situation. You, you interpret things into the other person that you want to see there, so that you love the other person. On the other hand, you yourself, of course, um, want to be the one that can be loved by that other person. So you start to behave in a way according to what you think that the other one would be able to love within yourself. Sorry that it's so complicated, but, but I think that was, that was this mirroring, like if you have two mirrors that opposite each other. And, and in that story, um, Henriette, when she starts to, to follow his plan, she says, I am now the one that you already saw in me before. <laughs> that was one of the first sentences that I started to write as a dialogue. Because I think it's central of the whole story. It means that it's hard to say who is the other person. I mean, maybe that's also what I was saying about the misunderstanding in the beginning. You can never know what is inside another person, what he's thinking or feeling, or what she is thinking or feeling. It will always be your personal interpretation. So it will always tell more about you <laughs> than about the other person. That is something that, that we all have to live with. And, and so, seen from this point of view, in every relationship there must be a misunderstanding. And in the movie it's also very it looked like a painting almost in many scenes, like the maid looked like this painting girl with a pearl earring. She has like the same yeah. clothes and the same look. Were you inspired by paintings in a way when you constructed the setting? Yes. At first I started to, um, to, to look at um, artworks from the 19th century because I thought maybe that give some inspiration, but then I found more that I had to go more back um, in time. Um, I was especially looking for images of rooms, because I knew that the film would be an interior film that takes place mostly interior, indoors. And um, I thought, how will I portray this inside of the apartment of the Familie Vogel? Um, and at the same time, the inside of an apartment, it's, uh, it's not only a, um, a realistic image, it's, it's also trying to create an atmosphere. And, and so I watched a lot of, of um, artworks, Im images, pictures, that, um, that portray rooms. And I was really interested because suddenly I understood also that rooms are standing for human beings, especially empty rooms. That's really interesting. 
And so I came to the idea that the, the room itself or the rooms have to have their own character. It's sometimes it's not that the movement of the actors ma make the like make the cut the ending of one scene. It's as if the rhythm of the film is following some other idea. And for me, it was more to show or to give the spectator the feeling that the human being in that room is passing. Someone comes, someone goes. And in the end, the conversation of the people that are left over, <laughs> the ones that did not die now, <laughs> they go on. They go on a little bit longer, but one day they will also leave the room. And that feeling of, of um, decay or, or arbitrariness, that is something that I tried to create. And it was also your first period drama because you, you have done dramas in modern time before. Uh, was it harder to make a drama like that in terms of money or costume or restrictions or was it as, you know, as before with others? I was uh, looking forward to doing that very much. I, as I said before, I was um, thinking of doing a film about a double suicide for a long time and all the, the scripts that I had written about that subject have been taken, were set in nowadays. It was a nowadays story. There was one story about that double suicide of the young kids that jumped off the cliff in Norway. There was a theater play called Norway Today. For a long time I followed that. I wanted to make a film about that. And then, as I said before, when I came across that story about Heinrich von Kleist, I was touched by the, <laughs> by the absurdity of it. And also I thought it's interesting for me to, to set the story in the past. It's, it's, it creates distance between me and the subject. And um, it's an artistic choice. It, it's like a playground, like if you want, Lourdes was the setting was Lourdes and it was fun to, to make the pictures of that Walt Disney sort of church that is in Lourdes and to, to have the documentary style of the pilgrims and the nuns and everything. And in this case I was I was really intrigued by the idea of trying to create this gone time, the exactly the dresses, the rooms the flow of time, the occupations, the singing, the, the way they talk. I was thinking it helps me to create a style or to, I did never want to like really be, um, it's, I'm not interested in, in creating something naturalistic about the 19th century. I'm much more interested in creating an, creating an artificial style. All my stories are, I think they are trying to be parables, to not only say what you see obviously, but to to be like a yeah, parable or a, or a tale. So would you say that you have a very specific artistic theme that you explore like in every movie, or do you think your themes change? Both. Yeah. <laughs> Some come back every time, others come and go. Can you tell us about your next project, or is it a secret? Um, it seems to be a secret because I don't know it yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm still doing uh, researches. I'm, I'm following two different tracks. But it's again, I always try to find something, some little story or some something of in the reality that gives me an inspiration. Even if I already know the, the topic or the theme. So I'm, I'm still in the process of searching. Looking behind the surface. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, do you work a lot with like subconscious inspiration, like from dreams or from from different angles that you don't really aware of, you think? Also, yeah. I mean, 
the most important thing is for me not to get too stressed that I might never have an idea again. <laughs> that is, that because then I do what comes tomorrow. Now, if I, if I follow the track or if I follow my research work, then the subconscious is free enough to produce some ideas and then they become a loser.